Uh, and it is my joy and honor and privilege to be opening the word this morning. And it truly is a privilege to be a part of a nation that allows us to gather like this, isn't it? And as we gather under that right that we have granted to us by the United States of America, I can't help but consider and remember the persecuted church around the world. We ought to carry a burden for our brothers and sisters because the kingdom is global. It's not national, it's global. And we should have a heart for those who today can't meet like this, that don't have a Bible sitting at home on the shelf to have access to the word of God. We should remember our missionaries who are risking their lives to fulfill the Great Commission in the darkest corners of the world and lifting them up in prayer. I want to add my voice and echo our, the invitation to the gathering this Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Um, Pastor Charity and Sebastian, our very own missionaries, are back from the Middle East. They're going to be sharing on Wednesday a bit of their experience. So if you'd like to, to greet them, love on them, get to hear their stories, unbelievable need around the world. And we're thankful to be in a nation that grants us freedoms. And we pray that those who don't have those freedoms would still have a knowledge of the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're continuing our series, Summer in the Spirit. Last week, Pastor took a look at the Holy Spirit as revealed in the image of a dove and the purity that the Holy Spirit possesses and that he builds in the lives of each believer. And today we are looking at the symbol of wind, the Holy Spirit as wind. Here in Florida, we know the importance of that gentle Gulf Coast breeze. Hey, are anyone in this room a 4th of July, like, Siesta Key person? You guys are insane. Insane. <laughs> I went to the Siesta Key one time on the 4th of July, and I was going to photograph a family. They had, like, a family reunion. I was there at 7.30 a.m. I got the last parking spot before the cops put the cones out, and let me tell you, the beach looked like a refugee camp. It was like everyone brought everything they owned. They're like, okay, we got to put up our tent and all the things. We know the importance of that beautiful, gentle sea breeze that comes off, that brings that relief to your soul. We understand the wind and how important it is. We also know how powerful the wind can be. A little thing called hurricane season started last month. We know the immense power that the wind holds, and it's fitting that the Holy Spirit is likened to the wind. Because even the Greek and the Hebrew words used to describe the spirit, the Greek word is pneuma and the Hebrew word is ruach. And both of those words can be translated spirit and they also can be translated wind or breath depending on their context. Every time we see the spirit, the Holy Spirit in the scripture, it's likened to the wind or the very breath of God. Our precious angel miracle boy turned six months old this week. I know, I know. It was a year ago on this weekend that we shared with you guys, our church family, that our miracle baby was on the way and what a joy it is. Uh, and there's a lot you do to prepare for parenthood, but something that no one tells you is going to happen in parenthood is this, that you are going to check if your child is still breathing multiple times a day. Every time I have gone to check if my son is still breathing, he has still been breathing, <laughs> praise God, but for some reason my assumption is always that he's not breathing. It's like 2 a.m. and I'm like going to go use the, rest, the restroom and then I'm like, mm, maybe I should go check and make sure the baby's awake and breathing and alive. And I wake him up out of a dead sleep and I'm like, okay, he's still breathing. Now he's miserable, but he's breathing. <laughs> because as a parent... I know the deep importance that there is air coming in and out of my son's lungs. I know the importance of the breath that he has to continue the life that I see for him. And let me tell you, there is a heavenly parent that is deeply concerned about the ruach, the pneuma, the breath going in and out of your spiritual lungs. Because in order for your life that has been regenerated in Christ to continue, you need a constant intake, exhale of the pneuma, of the ruah, of the Spirit of God. The wind, the breath of the Holy Spirit. He is deeply concerned with the condition of your spiritual breathing. We can't understand how deeply important it is to the Father without looking to the Scripture to see what the wind what the spirit is likened to. The first thing, like the wind, the spirit is powerful. 
It is powerful. Scripture says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power. Can you say that with me? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. The church, the followers of Christ, should have an innate power inside of them because of the Holy Spirit within them. And then when the word, the word is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, it says, On the day of Pentecost came, when they were all together in one place, suddenly, like a blowing, violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they received that power. They received that pneuma. They received that breath of the Holy Spirit that came to empower the church. And you know what? They received power and then they went out. The Holy Spirit is powerful. We know the gentle breeze that we enjoy on the 4th of July. And we also know the massively powerful, strong hurricane force winds that we can experience. The power of the Holy Spirit is that kind of forceful. It has that kind of ability. The power of the Holy Spirit is strong. One of my favorite scriptures is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. And it says, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit that you now try to accomplish these things with human efforts? Are you so foolish to have started with the Spirit and now you're trying in your own power to live a spiritual life? I have an oak tree in my backyard. It's huge. It's probably 100 years old. It's massive. And if I went out there this afternoon and I got my best shoes on, lots of traction, really planted my feet in there, and I I got back support, and if I pushed on that tree until I was red in the face, there is no way with my human effort, I could push that tree over. No way. But one hurricane, one hurricane, and it rips hundreds of decades-old trees out of the ground and their root systems. It just blows through in a day, and all of a sudden, there is an incredible power that's displayed that the wind possesses, and the Spirit has that same power. There are things, there are things you've started in the Spirit. You came to an understanding of Jesus. You know his name. You know who he is. But now you're living on your own efforts. You're living in your own power. And Christ is calling his followers to live with the power of the pneuma, the ruah, the spirit, the breath, the wind of the spirit. That can do in an instant what you can't do in all of your human effort. God calls us to be participants Scripture talks about working out your salvation, but you cannot save yourself. You cannot deliver yourself. There are generational sins that are passed from generation to generation, struggles, addictions. And no matter how hard you try, you can work your 12-step program and you might find some success, but the only one who can heal and deliver is a spirit. And it can happen in a moment. This week I heard a testimony of someone in our church. Uh, It came through my husband. I said, can you ask them if I can share that story? And so they said, yes, but if you're going to tell the story, you need to know the whole story. I said, okay, buckle up. So this gentleman in our church grew up in a small farm town with a father who was not a good father, who witnessed things done to his mother that no child should ever see. Anxious to get away, he had plans to go to college, but when his father left his mother and they divorced, uh, I walked the money for college. So he went into the military as a means of education and support. And there was still a deep brokenness in him. And he turned to alcohol, which was not the fix. And he became a slave to alcoholism for decades. Decades. He had racked up three DUIs. His marriage was in jeopardy. A judge told him, if I see you again, I'm sending you to prison. I don't care about your fancy lawyers. It's over. And then said, I'm revoking your license for 10 years. Because of that, he lost his six-figure paying job. Because when you can't get to and from work, it makes it a little difficult to do work. It was rock bottom. 
he traded in his keys for a bicycle. His wife had asked him to stay in a hotel because he was working some stuff out. But she said, you can come to church. We'll go to church as a family. So in a seat just like you're sitting in, the Holy Spirit said, I need you to come forward for prayer. Because the power of the Holy Spirit was in the room that day. The wind of the Spirit that is powerful was in the room that day. The Spirit is in this room today, just in case you missed it. So he came forward and he was met by my husband, Tommy, and Trish Pepper, who is an incredible prayer warrior. And if you don't know Trish, we're praying for a miracle that only God can do in her life and we're believing for it. But he came to the altar and he shared his struggle and Pastor Tommy prayed, God, remove the disease because alcoholism is a disease. You can work your 12 steps, you can find some success there, but only the wind and the power of God can blow in like a hurricane and remove the alcoholism. And in one moment at an altar, the desire was gone. There has not been another drink in seven years. There hasn't been a desire in seven years. He got on his bike because his license was still revoked. He started a business on his bicycle. He went and did H, uh, HVAC air conditioning work on a bicycle in the Florida heat, in the miserable rain. And Todd Case, one of our most valued team members here, had a life that was totally transformed and delivered because the Holy Spirit got a hold of his life. His marriage is strong. He has a beautiful daughter. They have an incredible business. They are a blessing to the body. He wasn't blessed for himself. He's a blessed to be a blessing. When the Spirit of God comes in and the wind and the power of the Spirit, there are things that can be broken off today. It can be a finished issue before you walk out the room. Your lunch can wait. The altars will open. Like the wind of the Spirit... Like the wind, the spirit is invisible, yet its effects are seen and felt. Like the wind, the spirit is invisible, but its effects can be seen and felt. In Galatians 5, there's a list of the fruit of the spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4, there are gifts of the spirit. They're what should be seen and felt, the effects of the spirit alive in us. If you're uncomfortable with the gifts of the Spirit, first of all, I'd encourage you to go through next steps. Step three talks about that, the gifts of the Spirit. But the gifts of the Spirit serve two purposes. One is to glorify God. And that should be a goal of every believer. And the second is to build up the church. And that should be a goal of every believer. If those aren't our goals, we've just turned into a social club. We're not coming just hang out with each other, give a high five, share a cup of coffee in the lobby, and then go out the same way we came in. We're here to be equipped and filled with the power and see the effects of the Spirit in our lives, that we're becoming more like Christ. The world loves to look at the church and criticize its brokenness because the church, though it is the beloved bride of Christ, is not without spot or blemish yet. When he comes back, he's coming back for a, a bride without spot or blemish, but we got some spots and blemishes. And the world loves to pick apart the brokenness of the church. There have been several docu-series that have come out in recent days that are picking apart brokenness in the church and calling out brokenness, and rightfully so. But in most of those cases, listening to these stories, there was a gift a gift of the Spirit, a gifted person, but they were lacking the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit should always precede the gifts. If you are gifted, but you're unloving, put it away until you develop that. If you are gifted, but you don't have self-control, God's calling you to develop some self-control with the Holy Spirit before you start operating in that gift. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruit. Could you imagine if every single person in this room, myself included, because I'm preaching to the choir here, actually walked out with those fruits every day into the marketplace, into restaurants, into their neighborhoods? If the world could see the effects of the Spirit rather than being told, oh, I'm a Christian, 
Could you imagine if the world could see it in us? To feel the effects of what it is to be loved by a Christian who is walking humbly before the Lord, going, hey, I'm broken, I messed up, but God's working on me. I'm doing my best to love you. I'm doing my best to be joyful. I'm doing my best to be patient. I'm doing my best to be full of peace. I'm doing my best to de develop self-control. And you know what? You're not doing your best. It's the Holy Spirit doing his best in you. And you should feel and see the effects of the Spirit alive in followers of Christ. The third thing is, like the wind, the Spirit is unpredictable. John chapter 3 is Jesus talking to Nicodemus about being born again. And he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everybody who is born of the Spirit. Inviting the Holy Spirit to do what he wills in your life is a beautiful and dangerous prayer. Because the wind of the Spirit, that powerful wind, may push you into something you didn't want to be in. But he's got a plan. When Scripture has the four winds described and talked about, like Scripture knew that there were four wind patterns before the science and the world. And anyways, anyways, anyways. There, when the Scripture talks about the wind, there are characteristics that are tied to each wind that's blowing. The east wind was a destructive wind, a wind of judgment and struggle. We see it in Joseph's dream in Genesis 41, where he has a dream that an east blustering wind blows in and it destroys the, the grain and there's a famine that's going to come in. It was an east wind. In Exodus 10, 13, it was an east wind that blew in the locust for the plagues in Egypt. In Hosea 13, it says, Though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, and the wind of the Lord will come up from the wilderness, and his springs will become dry. It's that east wind. Then there's a west wind that blows from the sea. It's the winds of change. It's the winds of blessing. It's the, it's the west wind that blew in and blew out the locusts when there was that plague. It says the west wind came and blew them away. The south wind is a warm wind of comfort. It says in the book of Job 37 that there is comfort that comes from the south. In Luke 12, 55, it says when you see the south wind blow, there shall be heat that will come to pass. And then the north wind the tempest that comes from the chambers, and the cold driving winds. That's Job 37, 9. There's these different winds as a Holy Spirit, and he uses them all. Sometimes there's a wind that blows in, that this, it blows in struggles. And you might feel God forsaken when the struggles get blown in. Or when there's a north wind that's harsh and cold and challenging. We like when the, the warm wind from the south blows in, we love that balmy breeze off the ocean. But in every season, the Holy Spirit, though seemingly unpredictable to us, has a plan. He has a plan. In Psalm 78, the psalmist is recounting a story that happened when God's people were in the wilderness. They were hungry. They had done the manna thing. Now they wanted something more substantial. They wanted some meat. And God miraculously provides quail for them. Ironically, I've never had quail in my life. This morning, after first service, someone gave me quail eggs. Whoa. Anyways, that wasn't in my notes, just free information. Have you ever seen a quail egg? It's this big. It's so cute. I'm going to do all of them for one meal. Anyways. They were hungry for quail, and their friend at church didn't bring them any quail eggs. The scripture says... In Psalm 78, verse 26, he loosed an east wind from heaven. And that east wind is that wind of struggle, is the wind of destruction. Here they are praying for food in the desert, in the wilderness. They're praying for meat, and God looses a wind of destruction. And in that moment, they could feel God forsaken. They could feel like God hasn't heard them, or he answered wrong. This is another little cute story. Uh, our... Rob, who is our um, facilities manager here, he has a granddaughter, and she was the other day telling her younger brother, it's okay, everybody makes mistakes. And he, she said, even Jesus makes mistakes. So her mother piped in and said, no, he doesn't. And she said, oh, yes, he does. 
Sometimes he answers me and says no. And sometimes our understanding of the Spirit of God is much like that of that little girl. When God says no or he answers our prayer not how we expected, we're like, Jesus, did you mess up? This is the wrong Amazon package. I would like the blessing, package of blessing, please. This one's for my neighbor. But the wind from the east kicks up and it starts the destruction. They could go, God, what are you doing here? But then it says, and then he made the south wind blow. And it made this whirlwind in the heavens. It blew the quail off the sea. And it rained down. There was not even hunting. Scripture says it was two cubits deep. That's up to your knees. They were up to their knees in provision. But it looked like a struggle. It looked like a trial when it first came in. But the very thing that should have destroyed them was the thing that brought them provision. That when the Holy Spirit blows you into a season you don't want to be in, ask God, what are you doing? Because he has a plan. The Spirit has a plan. When my precious family was moving from Canada to Sarasota, Pastor Scott and Darla are my parents, in case you didn't know. Love those guys. They were moving us from Canada, a thriving church, experiencing revival, to a little handful of people you could barely call a church that had no money, no resources. They had $128 in the bank that they overspent throwing us a welcoming party. Our treasurer says, we didn't just hit rock bottom, we lifted it up and we kept digging. <laughs> like church planters at least have like a team and support. We were coming to nothing. A handful of faithful people that are dearly beloved, some of which are still around today, we're thankful for them. But we were getting ready to move from, Saras or from Canada to Sarasota. So we put our house on the market and the house, uh, no one comes to see the house. That's always discouraging. Your open house, zero people come. Not Florida problems. <laughs> but nobody comes. And there's a knock on the door at dinner time. The four little tornadoes known as children had come home and already ruined everything that looked beautiful. And he said, I know it's after hours, but can I see your house? And my mom said, sure, nobody else wanted to see it, so come on in. It's a disaster. And he looked around and he said, you know, my wife's not going to like the color of the walls or the carpet, but we'll take it without his wife even seeing it. Before the days of Zillow where you can like send a listing, this is a man of faith. So the house is pending. It's under contract, but it hasn't gone through. And my mom is praying. It's a precious Christian family that we're selling the house to. My mom prays in her devotion, Lord, if there's anything wrong with this house, bring it to light. What a dangerous prayer. <laughs> and that night, our beautiful home caught fire. At 3 in the morning, our house was full of smoke. And by the grace of God, my older sister, Amanda, had just gone through the week before her fire safety training at school. She got me out of bed and she said, get below the smoke. Mom and dad are coming for us. And our parents got us out and got the dog out, praise the Lord. And our whole house was billowing with smoke. The men who had built our fireplace um, were drinking. And instead of putting a row of bricks and then mortar, it was a row of bricks and then beer caps. And every time we had a fire, it heated the windowsill inside the wall. So the fire was inside the wall, which is deeply dangerous because if it escapes, your house explodes. Praise God, that's not what happened. Pastor Scott, your brave, fearless leader, he grabbed a bucket of water, doused the one flame he saw on the windowsill and was ready to go back to bed. <laughs> Pastor Darla, who's a little more spiritual, said, you know what, we need to get out of here. <laughs> Call 911. So she's the reason we're all alive today. Um, but our house is destroyed. Everything is destroyed by smoke. There was smoke everywhere. And so my dad had to call the guy who was going to buy our house and say, we've had a fire, do you still want it? And he said, this is incredible. My dad said, excuse me, come again? He said, well, now my wife is gonna get to pick out the carpet she wants and the new color walls, and your insurance is gonna pay for it. <laughs> this is, this, I mean, I'm sorry you had a fire, but this is kind of ideal for us. And it was so close to the time we were moving we didn't have time to replace things, so the insurance company said, can we just write you a check? And we were moving from a two-story house with a basement to a one-story house that was much smaller, and it was like the Holy Spirit said, take this, not this, take this, not this. This is destroyed by smoke or the fire or the dry cleaner. Take whatever is not. There you go. Packing done. And my family lived off that check for months. 
pastor is a born Canadian. He chose to be an American. He actually was sworn in on July 4th, which is very special. But he came to America on a religious worker's visa. He couldn't just go down to Walmart and get a side hustle to pay the bills. When he moved to this church that had zero dollars and zero cents in their bank account, it was a step of faith. But the Holy Spirit led him there. And the very thing that looked like it was destroying our family was providing for our family. The Holy Spirit told him, because he didn't want to come. The church he was at, revival, incredible things happening. This church had hardly any people, no money, no support staff, nothing. But the Holy Spirit said, you can either go pastor five people with me, or you can pastor the thousand without me. And he packed his bags. He said, I can't do this without you. And lastly, like breath, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, sustains and revives us. Do you know you take 26,000 breaths a day on average? They say that 90% of your energy comes from your breathing, but that none of us are really living with maximized energy levels because we take these shallow breaths in our panicked, hurried state especially when you're preaching at the speed of light. <sighs> but when you take that deep breath from your gut, like where you're supposed to, deep breath, it clears your mind. It helps you to function better, think better, makes, strengthens your body physically, gives you strength. When God created our physical form, it was mimicking our need for the spiritual the spirit, the breath, the pneuma, the ruah. And we are sustained. If you've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, the spirit of God is in you. It is. It lives in you. And you can breathe in the spirit. But there's a difference from just being sustained and being revived. You might be in this room and there are things that feel dead and dry and gone. In Ezekiel 37, there's a story of the prophet Ezekiel standing in a valley of dry bones. Bones that are scattered all about. And the Lord asks him this question, can these bones live? Can these bones live? That there are things that are dry and desolate in us. We're just being sustained. It's just, it's just enough to get by. You barely made it to church this morning. Maybe it's the first time you've made it in months. And the Holy Spirit wants to do more than sustain you. He wants to revive like a deep breath into your lungs, your spirit that was designed to live in a dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament word for God is considered by many unpronounceable. And often when it's written, the vowels are omitted because of a sign of honor and reverence. And though unpronounceable, the word Yahweh mimics the sound of breath. Yahweh. Yahweh to breathe in and breathe out, God, the same way we do our breath, to be mindful of the spirit that desires to revive and bring back to life that which is dead. Ezekiel stood in the valley of dry bones, and the bones began to come together. The skeletal forms were revealed, and then tendon and muscle began to cover over them, and then skin covered over that but they were still dead. Now they looked the part, but there was no breath in their lungs. And the Lord says to the prophet, prophesy breath, prophesy son of man, and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds, the breath into the slain, and they may live. So I prophesied and I commanded, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Can these bones live? 
can the dream be revived? Can my son or daughter who seems so far from God, are they too far from his reach? The bones were dead and dry, and the breath entered them, and they came and stood to life. The same power of God that raised Christ from the dead is in this room. The same wind that blew in the upper room on the day of Pentecost that empowered believers to go into the world and change it, turn it upside down for Jesus Christ is in this room. There is no problem or struggle you walked in with today that the Holy Spirit couldn't uproot in a minute. There is no marital problem that is too far gone that God can't heal it. There is no need that you walked in with that God can't touch. And as we stand together and we come to the table of the Lord, I want to remind you as we celebrate freedom that the real freedom we celebrate is the freedom we have in Christ. Scripture says, where the Lord is, there is freedom. Would you stand with me as we get ready to receive communion? But before we do, if you haven't made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, this is your moment. If you need to breathe in that breath into your spiritual lungs and be revived, this is your time. So church, would you pray with me out loud all together? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Forgive me of my sins. I turn from them. And I turn towards you, Lord, to receive your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and never giving up on me. Just before we finish that prayer with eyes still closed and heads still bowed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, if God is breathing fresh life into your lungs, just raise your hand. Just look at me. I see you. Praise God. Praise God. All of heaven is rejoicing. I see your hand. All of heaven is rejoicing. Can these bones live? Can these bones live? As we hold the elements of communion in our hands, we hold the bread that's a symbol of the body of Christ that was broken for us, the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Not just for America, but for the world. We thank God for the sacrifice of his son. And as we take the bread together, we utter these words, by your stripes, I am healed. Let's take the bread together. And scripture says in the same way, Jesus took the cup after dinner and said, this is my blood poured out for you. We're thankful for the blood of our savior spilled on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, something significant happened in that the spirit that we're talking about, the spirit of God that wants to live inside of us, sustain us and revive us, show us the power that he's called us to walk in, that give us the fruits and the gifts, that spirit that was contained behind the curtain in the holies of holies. When Jesus breathed his last, the curtain in the temple ripped from top to bottom, releasing the spirit of God from the holy place into our lives, into our homes, into our bedrooms, into our cars. So as we take the cup together, we make this declaration, Jesus, you are my Savior, and Jesus, you are my Lord. Take the cup. So, Father, we thank you for your precious spirit that's in the room this morning. I'd like to invite the prayer ministers to come to the front and to remind you it was a Sunday just like this when Todd was sitting in a chair just like yours and the Holy Spirit said, move, go, come forward. And the Holy Spirit did something miraculous in Todd's life. He's still doing miracles. He's still in the business of setting people free. He's still in the business of healing people. He's still in the business of restoring marriages, of bringing hope to the hopeless situation. He is here and he is in the room. Don't miss your miracle because you're busy. 
Don't just choose to be sustained instead of reviving something that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life today. So, Father God, we thank you, God, that your spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, comes and it empowers your believers. It empowers your church. It brings life to the lifeless. It brings hope to the hopeless. And it sets the captives free. Father, we believe, Lord, that this morning there is a miracle in the room. And, God, we don't want to miss what you have for your people, your church, in this moment. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are alive and well. And the spirit of God is blowing in this house. 